that you're here to be with us. And some of you who haven't been here in a little bit will see that we've made a lot of changes, been a lot of hard work and effort that has went into it. And we're very grateful. And uh, uh, if you uh, get a chance before you leave, you can go look at the fellowship hall, the children's church room, and Sunday school classes. Feel free to do that. We've overhauled about everything over there. And uh, we're, we're really happy that you came to be in service with us this morning. This is exciting. Amen. This is so exciting that I, I kind of wish I was preaching something else. Amen. But uh, I... Uh, How many of you know the Lord has a sense of humor? The Lord has a sense of humor. You can find it in the Bible at various times. And he has a sense of humor with preachers too. Because uh, uh, he has a tendency, or we have a tendency, when things begin to go cattywampus, uh, not only in our lives, but when you pastor a church, when things go cattywampus and everybody, y'all know what cattywampus is, don't you? Okay, man, it's a tough crowd today. I may have to start preaching to all of them watching on the internet because I sure get a lot of amens from them throughout the week. And uh, they people come up to me in all the grocery stores and everything saying, I watched you, you was tearing it up this Sunday morning. And I'm thinking, oh, Lord, what did I say? Because I forget about that. But uh, uh, we have a tendency... When things go cattywampus in our life, and then as a pastor, when you see things start going cattywampus in, in other folks' lives, it, you, you can't help but take it personal. And the first thing that will run through your mind that the devil will put through your mind is, boy, you sure are doing some good. You sure are doing some good. You're helping people change their lives, and, and you're helping them so much that they're getting worse, not better. Can I get an amen? Amen. <laughs> And then so you begin to look in the Word of God, begin to look in the Bible, and, and I started, there's one particular passage of Scripture, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to preach on it, though I, I really would like to, but I, I went to that passage of Scripture because I thought, Lord, I've got to find something, or, or you know, they're, they're going to run me out of town, or I'm going to get, I'm going to run myself out of town, or what have you, you know, you know, I started, and, uh, and, and here I go again, but I started feeling the hee-haw song come on me. Y- y'all know what I'm talking about? Glo- you know, gloom, despair, and agony on me. Anybody ever sung that before? Huh? Started feeling the hee-haw song coming on me. And, and uh, so I, I just uh, I, I got into the Word of God. And, and the Lord, and what I said about a sense of humor is, is the Lord just starts, He'll just explode something from the Bible right into your life. And He'll make you feel about this tall. Man, I'm going to tell you what, it's going to get crazy in here in a few minutes this morning. Y'all or me one is going to do something. I, I, and so the Holy Ghost has a way of bringing things in perspective. And I'm going to do something this morning as I begin this lesson that, uh, that we used to do when I was just a little fella. And uh, I, I'm, going to, I'm going to just guess that some of you all used to do the same thing. Notice I have the emphasis on used to. We used to gather around in the living room before we went to bed at night and Daddy would break the Bible open and he would just read to us. Out of the Bible. How many of y'all remember that happening when you're a little person? That ain't near as many hands as I was expecting. But I want to read the Bible to you for just a minute this morning. And then I'm going to try to minister by the help of the Lord. But Psalms 144 and verse number 1 says, Blessed, boy, I might go crazy. I'm going to let you know something. You ever get a relationship with the Word of God? This coming to church and bumping shoulders with church folks cannot be all the relationship with God that you have. You need to crack that word at least once and once or twice a day if you can. Get the word down in you. David said, I'll hide his word in my heart that I might not sin. Don't you know that this word of God stands as a buffer between you and sin? It stands as a buffer between you and hell. It stands as a buffer between you and the powers of the enemy. It's the sword of the Spirit. It's the word of God. It is forever settled in heaven. You need to fall in love with the word of God. 
And when I read the Word of God, and, and, I, and, I, and I, I told you I start thinking pitiful, and preachers are people too, okay? And sometimes I get in trouble for being more people than I do preacher, but you just have to excuse me for that sometimes. But the very first line of this excites me because it said, Blessed be the Lord, my strength. We cannot start thinking that our strength is in ourselves. Our strength is in the Lord. <clears throat> Which teacheth my hands to war and my fingers to fight. Your hands hold a sword, your fingers pull back the bow. That's probably what that's talking about. Notice, he says, my goodness and my fortress, my high tower and my deliverer. My shield and he in whom I trust, who subdueth my people under me. It's talking about your enemies. Lord, what is man that thou takest knowledge of him? Or the son of man that thou makest account of him? Man is like to vanity. His days are as a shadow that passeth away. Bow thy heavens, O Lord, and come down. Touch the mountains and they shall smoke. Cast forth lightning and scatter them. Shoot out thine arrows and destroy them. Send thine hand from above. Rid me and deliver me out of great waters from the hand of strange children. Whose mouth speaketh vanity and their right hand is a right hand of falsehood. I will sing a new song unto thee, O God, upon a psaltery and an instrument of ten strings. Will I sing praises unto thee? It is he that giveth salvation unto kings, who delivereth David his servant from the hurtful sword. Rid me and deliver me from the hand of strange children, whose mouth speaketh vanity, and their right hand is a right hand of falsehood. That our sons may be as plants grown up in their youth, that our daughters may be as cornerstones polished after the similitude of a palace. That our garners may be full, affording all manner of store. That our sheep may bring forth thousands and ten thousands in our streets. That our oxen may be strong to labor. That there be no breaking in nor going out. That there be no complaining in our streets. Verse 15. Happy is that people that is in such a case, yea, happy is that people whose God is the Lord. This is a messianic psalm, meaning that it's meant to be read with the coming of Jesus Christ as the focus. There's some apocalyptic language or some language that would speak to the coming of the Lord and to the, the shape of the world and, and fire is going to fall down and the Bible tells us plainly that all the elements are going to melt with fervent heat and there is some allusion to that in this passage. But we must remember that all Scripture, everybody say all Scripture, is God-breathed or given by the inspiration of God and is profitable. It's profitable for us. What does it mean to be profitable? It means it's worth something to you. There's some gain in it for you. It is profitable, the Bible says, for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. In more modern language, it is for teaching. The Word of God is all for teaching us. And then it is to reproof or discipline us. Then it is to correct us or get us back on the right track, and then it is for instruction in righteousness, which is what? Keeping you on the right track. So it's to teach me in the beginning what's right. It is to, to discipline me or chastise me when I'm wrong. But then it just doesn't, doesn't chastise me, but it puts me back on the right track. And then there's power in the Word of God to keep me on the right track. That ought to excite somebody again. I'm telling you, you got to fall in love with the Word of God. That's in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 16. I was searching for a scripture, as I told you, that dealt with a totally different matter. You're welcome to go read it if you'd like to, to get another lesson. Proverbs 14 and 4 said, Where no oxen are, the crib is clean. But much increase is by the strength of the ox. You can just ponder what I might have been going to teach about that. But I was searching for that scripture that dealt with a totally different matter. And I was led to this passage. 
Now, while much of the language is archaic and out of date, it's, it's King James English, and, and it's sometimes difficult to understand. There are many outlets, many translations and commentaries by which these scriptures are made more clear to us. We have to always be aware that it is the desire of God that we not only hear, but that we understand everything He wants to say to us. The Lord is not going to say anything to you and then keep you from understanding it that is essential to your salvation. He wants you to know everything you need in order to be saved. Yep, that's the truth. It is the desire of God that we understand everything He wants to say to us. I almost preached a message again this morning. I had about 12, really about four, but it felt like 12 different messages. I feel like letting some folks know, oh Lord Jesus. The reason why you're having to go through the same thing over and over and over and over and over again is you ain't got it right yet. And the perspective that you're looking at is I can't believe God's letting this happen to me again. And I'm letting you know that the reason why it's happening to you again is not because He's wanting to punish you, because He's giving you another chance to get it right. Oh, I felt Jesus in the house right now, the Holy Ghost. It's not the business or the will of the Lord that we fail, but that we succeed. And sometimes we stay on this merry-go-round or this carousel going round and round and round like we're getting nowhere. And it's not because hells will turn loose in our life. It's because God is giving you another opportunity to get things right. And then He glories. When we obey. That's when the Lord gets glory. Is when we submit to his will. I believe it's possible that Matthew Henry said it best. In his commentary. When men are finally elevated to their place of fulfillment. Can I tell you that it is the will of God. That everybody under the sound of my voice. Reach that place of fulfillment. Everybody that's in this room today. It is not the will of the Lord. That you fall short in any way. Of what he has for you. When men are finally elevated to their place of fulfillment, and that will be no easy trip. And it is a problem in the world that we live in today. It's a hindrance because everybody wants instant gratification at the least amount of cost. Uh, and I noticed Mr. Ricky's here today, and I, I'm thinking, I'm, I'm grateful that he came to be in church with his mama, but I, I remember a conversation that him and I had when once when we were visiting her at the hospital, and he talked about retirement and, and having retired. And, and let me tell you something, ain't nobody going to drop retirement in your lap. You get to retire because you worked hard. <laughs> huh? You get to retire, you get to benefit from working hard. But people, the, the, the ideology that's out in the world has crept into the church and we feel like that we're going to get something for nothing. It don't happen in God's world. It don't happen in the real world. And it's not going to happen in the world to come. It's not an easy trip to fulfillment. The world wants drive through. I, I heard that you can get married at a drive through window now. I read that the other day. You can get saved at a drive through window. They kind of got like drive through movie theater churches you can go to. You put your pajamas on and your house slippers on and your bathrobe on and kick back in the truck and get saved. God have mercy on us. When we stand shoulder to shoulder with people that shed their life's blood and just to be able to speak the name of Jesus and we think that we can just saunter in somewhere and, you know, slap a five in the plate and lift up our hands three times and say four hallelujahs and we're saved. Let me tell you something. To whom much is given, much is required. It's going to take some effort. It's going to take some work. It's going to take some diligent pursuit of the things of God. You hear me well right now. It's going to take an altar of repentance. It's going to take you getting on your face before God and putting in some effort to make yourself better. The only way we're going to get better is at the feet of Jesus. The only way we're going to be made into something different than we are is in the hands of the potter.
It takes some hard work and some effort. It's not an easy trip up the mountain. The journey to fulfillment is a continuous struggle. I was reminded this morning, we all battle with sin. Can I get an amen? Amen. I was reminded this morning, and I, I didn't look at the passage, I just remember the one point when Paul said, I find in a law, I mean it's all the time, that when I would do good, when I want to do good, evil is present with me. The opportunity, it's a, man I feel Jesus up in here, please receive the word of the Lord. It is a continuous struggle coming up the mountain. And sometimes you'll take one step forward and two steps back. But I come to tell you this morning, under the authority of the Holy Ghost, uh, don't stop climbing. Don't stop climbing. Keep on going up the mountain because it's going to be worth it when you get up there. Keep on working. Keep on stretching. Keep on crying. Keep on praying. Keep on repenting so God can help you up the mountain. But as we get there, Brother Pete, we can never lose sight of anything I have ever gained, anything I have ever accomplished, anything I have ever become to be. It's all because of the glory of God. It's all because of the strength of God. He brought me through it. He brought me to it. And He's going to take me on from here. We've got to always give glory to God. When I praise the Lord, it's not because I like a good song. It's And then the songs minister to me. When I praise the Lord, it's not because I want you to follow suit. When I I praise the Lord, it's because it was Him that brought me to this place right now. And I owe it all to Him. It was God who's prepared us for this place and it was strength that brought us to this place. You remember when I came back from Israel that I, that I ministered one night using the blessing that they gave us. Remember the blessing of Jerusalem? Whether it be standing on the battlefield of life covered in blood, sweat, or tears, or rejoicing with the saints as we gather around the feet of Jesus. It will always be fitting and appropriate to pray this prayer of blessing. Blessed are you, eternal God, sovereign of all, for giving us life. Somebody say, Happy Mother's Day. <laughs> for giving us life, sustaining us, and enabling us to reach this moment. Blessed are you, eternal God, sovereign of all, for giving us life, sustaining us, and enabling us to reach this moment. If you could shut your eyes for just a minute. And some of us, it will come quickly. For others, we'll have to think. But can you look back down the road of your life and recognize there was a place where there was a war that went on? and hell tried to take you and the enemy tried to destroy you and you were dilly dallying around with the clutches of hell but the Lord stepped in it was that make or break moment when you could have died when you could have went out into eternity with your destiny unsure but you realize that the Lord brought me to the kingdom for such a time as this it's the blessing of a pilgrim who has arrived at their destination and as in the case of Jewish pilgrims, as they stood looking over Jerusalem, as the end all to end all, we recognize that each victory we win, each victory, no matter how small, no matter how small, that each victory we win, the first time, the first day, that you don't slip and fall on the same stretch of ice, if you'll allow me to say it that way, of life. The first time when you realize it's there and i got to go around it, uh, that is a victory. That is another rung. It's another step uh, on the ladder. And we're all going to keep climbing until we reach that place called heaven. Heaven is not on earth. Uh, heaven is not here. This is not the end all to end all. Jerusalem over in Israel, it's not the holy place. Uh, the holy place is the new Jerusalem that's going to come down from God uh, out of heaven. Uh, we cannot be enamored with the things of this life, but, but we've got to fall in love with the life that's coming. Uh, notice the last verse. That's the focus of today's word. When he said, happy is that people that is in such a case. Yea, happy is that people whose God is the Lord. What in the world does that mean? Happy are the people 
whose God is the Lord. What does that mean to you as, you as you think about it? Happy are those to whom God has given that most desired, that most coveted, that most sought after victory. That is of conquering and living in dominion over ourself. That is the victory that you need to fight the hardest for, that you need to strive the strongest for. It's not to get one over on your neighbor. It's not to, to buy a better present for your mama than your brother or sister might have done. It's, it's not the, the petty little things that we, you know, uh, who paid the most for a new pair of britches or, or who got the newest cool shoes or, or who got a more expensive vehicle or automobile or who lives in a bigger house. Uh, the greatest victory that you and I need to aspire to, strive to, and try to reach uh, is that of living a life of dominion over the flesh where we are no longer ruled by our mind and our thoughts and our heart but we are ruled by the power of God in our life that got about as many amens as I expected because we don't like that we don't like that I thought the other day uh, he's not in here so I'm going to I'm going to use him as an example though I ain't scared to do it when they are in here that probably ain't cool but uh here a couple of days ago, Garrison turned 18. Now, he, he inherited a lot of stuff from his mama. The good stuff. He inherited the bad stuff from me. Happy Mother's Day, baby. But he's been telling me, he's been telling me since he was just a little fella. When I get 18, how many of y'all said that? You know, there might, be, there might be the dumbest words that ever come out of somebody's mouth. When I get 18, I'm gone. When I get 18, I'm my own boss. You know what happened when he got 18? Nothing. But for some reason... We all aspire to that day or that time when we're our own boss. When we can do our own thing. But I would submit to you that the greatest maturity, the greatest fulfillment is when you finally realize I will never be my own boss. I'm never going to be totally in charge. I'm never going to be totally in control. But I do... I am thankful that I have the option to choose who I serve. And as Joshua of old said it, choose you this day whom you'll serve. Whether the God of your fathers on the other side of the flood or the God of the people in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house... But as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Don't you know it's an exciting thing to know you get to choose who you serve? The enemy cannot decide. I feel Jesus in here right now. The enemy cannot decide that you're going to serve him. But the Bible says, don't you know that whom you lend yourself members to? Where your mouth is going, your eyes are going, your hands are going, your feet are going, where your body's going, that's who you serve. Where you spend your money is who you serve. Where your efforts and where your energies go, that's who you serve. We get to choose. But happy are those whose God is the Lord. It is amazing the extent that we will go to to satisfy our egos, our appearance, our social standing and our finances. I'm blessed and fortunate to be able to work at the funeral home from time to time. And I wish I had a dollar for every time because people talk a lot at the funeral parlor. Just let me give you a warning. Next time you're down there visitating, but we'll be careful, little mouth, what you say. <laughs> People talk a lot at the funeral party. And Brother Larry, if I had a dollar for every time I heard somebody say, I wonder where all that money's going now. And you know something, Brother Pete? I, I ain't never. I have never, never been asked to fill anybody's casket full of greenbacks. Never. Never.
Now, I've sat and watched the kids fight over it. Quit talking to one another. You know what? We spend so much effort and so much time on everything that ain't going to last. You're going to go out of here in one suit of clothes. That's it. That's it. And if you're a long drink of water like me, you ain't going to be able to even wear your shoes in there probably. Because there ain't room. But we spend so much effort and so much time on these things that are temporary. Sister Maria, someday everybody in this room going back to the dirt. Unless the Lord comes first. The only way you're going to get out of here alive is a trumpet sound. But we spend so much effort and so much time on this. Y'all can tell I've spent a whole lot of time on it too. I get get in trouble by my wife for wearing the same stuff over and over again. But there's only one part of you that's going to live forever. We spend so much effort and so much money and so much time and so much of our energy on the part of us that's going to fail and fail quickly. And we neglect the only part of us that is eternal is our soul. Say, well, I've been set free. What have you been set free of? Think about it. How much, how many millions and gazillions and and quintillions of dollars are spent on something that ain't going to make it out of here? I saw a little fella. I've been there before, okay. I've been there before. My first car was a Renault. That my, my, my mom and daddy got for me. You remember that little gray Renault? Yeah. Yeah. I'd run it out of water and run it hot and warp the head and bye-bye Renault. But I had a buddy that had one of the coolest cars in the entire world. He's my friend. He's a 49 Willys Overland Jeepster convertible. Had glass packs on it, red. <laughs> it wasn't nothing better than to go slow roll. These kids that think they, that driving fast is a way to get attention, they're nuts. The way to get attention is you put that baby down in low and just let her lope down the middle of Main Street. And then when you got in front of Stover's or, or P&J Furniture is what it used to be, they got all them windows up in front, and guess what? You can see yourself. How many of you know, I saw a little fella like this the other day. He was riding, 16-year-old buddy, and he wasn't old enough yet. And he was riding in his friend's pickup truck that was all jacked up and loaded and stuff. How many of you have ever been the, the friend that you got, when you see yourself, you got to lean out over the edge just a little bit. You got to cock your head back just a little bit. You can't smile at nobody. That ain't cool. But you want too bad. How many ever heard about your cheeks keep from grinning? Because it ain't cool. It ain't cool to act like you're enjoying yourself. You got to act like that you're miserable. So you're cool. Think about that. Can't wait to get, if I could just get the right truck, if I could just get the right car, if I could just get the right this, then I'm going to make it. And about two weeks into having that pickup or that car or whatever, you find out it don't keep that smell all the time. And it don't keep that pretty look all the time. You got to keep cleaning it because, because everything in this life, everything in this life is either going one or two directions. It's living or it's dying. Except for our soul. Our soul is going to live forever. Philippians chapter 3. We put so much effort, so much, man, I I couldn't wait till the weekend so I could look cool. That was all it was, look cool. Could pick up no girls, wouldn't know what to do with them if I had picked them up. (laughs) So they didn't want no dummy like me. I was so skinny, my goose was stuck out past my chin. 
And I thought I looked cool. But I found out there's something in life that's so much more valuable. There's a confidence that can't no pickup truck give you or no 